groups for the 4N uh, tutorials are almost formed. Um, it's been taken quite a process to get everyone's constraints figured out. I've emailed a few of you, shifted you around a bit, but by and large, I think there's only a handful of people that didn't quite get exactly the options they'd like, but so I'll put, post those later on the course website today. I just want to do a final check on them. Um, let's take a look at where we ended off uh, yesterday. Oh, sorry, I should say on Monday. We were looking at time value of money and from an investment point of view. So if you deposit some money in a bank account and you grow your investment at a certain interest rate I, that value of the investment in the future, our future balance F, is larger. And we can see that from the formula we, we use that F, our future value, is whatever we invest present P times the interest rate I raised to the power N. And since that term in that bracket is a value that's greater than one, that investment will then grow in, in size. So take a, a second, uh, use your calculator, and let's use this as an example. $826 to, today, what is it worth a year from now at 10% interest? So $826 today. What is that worth at 10% a year from now? Sorry? 909. Okay, so let's ignore cents in this course. We will never work with cents. In fact, in many cases, we'll even drop all the thousands and just work rounded to the nearest thousand. But in this case, so $909. If you reinvest that money for another year, so now you're going into your second year, what is that worth at the end of that second year? 1000 $1, okay. So after that second year, you have 1000 If you invest that again, at 10%, you get 1,100. You invested it for another period of time, you get 1,210. So that money is growing at that interest rate I. So we've got to, we, we're comfortable with this concept. This isn't anything that's new for us. But what might be new is seeing this formula being used to calculate that, because you don't have to jump from 826 to 909, and then 909 to 1,000 in two separate equations. You can do it in one go by subbing in here 826 times 1.1 raised to the power 2, and then you'll get straight to that $1,000. Okay. So you can do that way that's shown there on the right. That would be typical of a spreadsheet approach. Or you can do it the way shown on the left and just jump straight to the particular value you'd like, 5, 6, 7, however many periods into the future, this period n. Okay, and then I, as I said in, in the prior class, our periods are typically of one year in duration. Now, I also left you last class thinking about interest rates, and I showed you a table of interest rates uh, for government bonds, in fact, which is a good surrogate for interest rates from different countries. But let's take a look at the Canadian perspective. Many of you will work in Canada and stay in Canada for most of your life. So we should be certain that that interest rate I is not constant. In fact, it, it definitely changes. And one way to see that is through this chart of historical data related to the financial industry. One of those graphs here, though, is the, is the, the rates that you can typically get from an investment as well as from an inflation perspective. So I do want to take a look at this orange curve. That's the prime rate that would be typical of interest rates of money that you could earn. And what we're seeing here, all the way over to the left, the 1950s, and then in this period where your parents uh, were probably investing most heavily and just graduating and starting their careers, and then this is now the period you're finding yourselves in. Okay, so very, very low interest rate environment. Also, let's take a look at the gray curve here, inflation. Inflation, when your grandparents were buying houses, this would be determining their mortgage rates. Their mortgages may have peaked for a period of time and then were relatively flat. 
Your parents' generation, though, that period of the mid-70s to 80s, had a phenomenal turbulence in mortgage rates. Double-digit mortgage rates were not uncommon. People really struggled to make ends meet, and that caused a lot of upheaval. But in this decade, certainly the decade when I bought my house back in 2007, I've not experienced any of that. I've only experienced 2 3% mortgage rates, and to me that seems the norm. But there's no guarantee that these interest rates, these I's that we use here, are static values. They're changing all the time. We will make an approximation in this course that they're relatively constant. But my key with showing you this particular plot is that that's really not always the case. You can use an average that will balance out over time, but this is very much an unsteady number. Okay? And this particular plot is interesting. If you get the original, uh, you can Google it or you can purchase one from Morningstar. Um, they're called an index chart up here. They've changed their name recently. They got bought out. Um, but what, what's nice about this plot is that it shows various world events that have happened here, and you can see how those have triggered changes in the interest rates. So wars and certain in, if, uh, world events have an effect on that. Okay? In yellow here, you see the, the U.S. dollar versus Canadian dollar exchange rate and how that's pretty much been at par recently, but then back in the early part of the decade, we were down at 60 cents. But it hasn't always been like that, right? So, it's, so it's, there's a, a wealth of information here. These upward trajectories, I'll talk a bit about that in a future tutorial on Thursday and Friday. Uh, those give you stock market trends. Yeah. Can you post that? No, I can't. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> This is commercial. You have to purchase one or, or, or find the information elsewhere. I can't legally post it. Yeah. Okay? But you can easily uh, research it, and they're not too expensive to buy. To buy. Okay, so that's, that's the concept of interest. And this spreadsheet is posted on the course website. I, I just posted them this morning. They're available on a link that I give on the course website. And they look something like this down here at the bottom. Uh, so in today we're in class um, 2B, so in the prior class 2A on Monday was week 2, the first class in the week 2A. We looked at that, um, that particular plot, and you can go look at the formulas here, how I calculated them. So there's the formulas up there in that Google spreadsheet. You can download it, you can go view it online, however you choose to look at it. Um, so... You can always reproduce these results for yourself and see how I calculated them. So here's that idea of the $1,000. If you invest it, it will grow to $1,100, then $1,200, and keep growing in value. And so we have this, uh, this little drawing that Dr. Marlin added to his slides, that if you want to get rich, you should just invest your money and wait. Let's take a look at that. This example is someone who takes $10,000 every year. So it's not a single 10000 You take $10,000 out of your money, which is a lot for you guys right now, but when you start working, $10,000 isn't that much. It's less than $1,000 a month that you set aside. And if you invest that $10,000 every year, you set that same dollar figure aside, and it grows at 5%, which is a reasonable value. After 45 years, which is about when you will retire, it's grown to $1.6 million. So... Over 45 years, you've set aside $455,000. That's all it's costed you, but that money has grown to $1.6 million. And in a prior tutorial, I've shown the students that that's actually a pretty reasonable number to retire on for, for modest type requirements. Okay, so you can do fairly well on that, but there's an important point that I'll raise in a few minutes, that it's not, it's not entirely true. Okay, yes. It's not reasonable? Okay, you wouldn't get that from a bank, no. But you can get that on the stock market quite easily. Okay, if you look at exchange traded funds and, and stable investments, you can quite easily get 5%. So it's, it's not an unreasonable value to be looking at. Okay, so it's, that's exponential growth, the concept of exponential growth. And we looked at that before. Now, I'm going to... We've got the slide 23 and 24 in your notes here. I'm going to jump over them. I'll come back to them in a few seconds. Let's take a look here at slide 25. And I'd like you to work through this example because while it's relatively straightforward, it's showing us 
how we're going to deal with these sorts of cash flows in the course. There's a very important concept here in how we deal with this. So let's take a look at this example. And what we're doing here is I'm showing you someone's bank account. And in their first month, there's $4,000 of money flowing into their bank account and nothing flowing out. They're earning 5% interest on their bank balance. I'm going to assume for this class that the interest on that $4,000 gets paid in the next period, on the very first day of the next period. So the bank doesn't give you the interest right away. They wait till the next month and then put whatever interest you've earned in your bank balance the very, at the very first day of the next period. Okay, and then it, that keeps propagating. So what I'd like you to do, and this is really shaky for, I don't know, for some reason this projector isn't, um, stable. So what happens here is I'd like you to plot what the bank balance looks like over time. Over those, let's just work up to period two. So let's just do the first three months by hand. I'll give you a minute or two to start with that and then I'll take it up and show you systematically how to work with it. But at least try to solve up to the end of the first month. So do two, two iterations, month zero and month one. What is the bank balance going to be? The cash flow and the bank balance. If you, to get the bank balance, you need the cash flow. Do it by paper in a systematic type way. Okay, what's the balance at the end of the first month? The balance at the end of the first month? Okay, the z month zero. What's the balance at the end of the second month? M or month n equals one. The balance. What do you see in the balance at the end of the n equals 1, at the end of the second month? 4, 3. Okay. Everyone got that? Okay, let's take a look at, it's, it's fairly quick to calculate by hand and in your mind, but let's look at a systematic way. It's going to look like I'm doing a bit of an overkill here, but I'm going to intentionally start on a simple problem and then the same overkill process won't look so overkill a few weeks from now when these get a lot more complicated. So as long as we follow a systematic process, this, um, this is quite straightforward. So revenue in the first month, 4,000 expenses, that's our cash flowing in, our cash flowing out. We have another source of cash flowing in and that's interest. So interest 
is another source of cash flowing in. And in that first month, the interest earned is zero. And the way we do that, you can obviously just go ahead and write zero over here. But what's a whole lot better is you illustrate to the TA or myself that's grading this why it is zero. Okay? And we do that by using notes. We don't go put calculations here in the table. We don't want to mess up this table with a whole lot of, of equations. So let's simply put our final result here, but let's explain why we got it over there. So our first note is that assume interest is paid in the period following or let's say, assume interest is paid in the period after it is earned. Okay, that explains why we're earning no interest in the first month. So then we can report our next line, which is the net cash flow. The net cash flow is revenue in minus expenses out plus interest. So if we call this A, B, C, and then let's call our net cash flow D, we can then put a note here that my net cash flow D is equal to A minus B plus C. So money flowing in minus money flowing out plus interest earned. Okay, which in that case, my net cash flow is 4,000 minus zero plus zero. So I can simply put a value of 4,000 here. And we typically don't put dollar symbols everywhere. Just leave them, leave them out. And so at the end of that period, my bank balance, my bank balance, as all of you said, was was zero, I uh, sorry, it was $4,000 in the end of the first period. But let's be specific about how the balance is calculated. The balance <coughs> is equal to the net cash flow, so D plus the balance from the prior period. which in this case is D plus zero. The prior period we're assuming we have nothing to start with. This is our first cycle. So my balance there is 4,000. Okay, way overkill for this example, but very quickly you'll see why it's necessary to be so specific. I do want to just make a note here on one convention. Notice that Dr. Marlin has expenses as negative values up there in his table. I've, you can go either way. I really don't mind as long as you're consistent. I've chosen to report expenses as positive values, but then when I use my expenses, I say A minus B minus expenses plus interest. If you're going to use negatives for your expenses, then that equation would simply just change to A plus B plus C, and you still get the same result. But it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. Okay, so now if we go ahead and calculate our, our next entry over here, the interest earned in the first period was how much? 200, and how is that calculated? five percent times the prior balance okay which in this example is 0.05 times four thousand so we get two hundred dollars that we can report over here Okay, and then the net cash flow in that 
second month was how much? What's your cash flow, the net cash flow? Any numbers? Not, no tricky questions here. 530. OK, so our net cash flow followed in the same way. Now, I don't need to re rewrite that. Just simply, we know now that it follows the same approach. So it's money flowing in, 530 minus 200 plus 200 equals 530. Okay, because we're using the fact that D is equal to A minus B plus C. And then finally, the balance at the end of that first month, we get the number that you had, that you had all found, or most of you found, 4530. <clears throat> And that follows that rule that we had here from earlier. The balance is whatever D was, row D, plus the balance from the prior period. So D was 530 plus 4,000 from the prior period. Okay. Everything clear on those first two cycles, the first two periods. Okay, go ahead and try the third period and what and find out what those three numbers are in the table Okay, so the numbers you should get here then are 227, 187, and 4717. Okay, we don't report cents at all. Okay, everyone comfortable with those? Any questions? Okay, so, so money balances are no different to mass balances that you've done in 2D and 2F. Flows in, flows out. But this is just how we will systematically do them as shown here on the board. Okay, now we will, um, as, as I said, I'll post these spreadsheets for you. And we'll typically do this in a spreadsheet, even in the tutorials that come on Thursday and Friday. Bring your laptops, bring your calculators and, and tablet computers, and feel free to do this in spreadsheets. There's no need to be doing this by hand. But this systematic approach I've shown here on the board is unfortunately required for tests and exams because that's the only way we can do it that way. So if you went and, and, and created the spreadsheet here, you should get something like this and you can then plot the account balance in red. So it shows that our balance increases and then drops off and then in blue are the cash flows. A really high cash flow that first month and then the net cash flows in the subsequent months after that. So a visual viewpoint of that. Okay, so that's uh, looking at it from an investment point of view. Now I'd like to take a look a little bit at those two prior slides I skipped. So back to slide 23 and 24. And I want you to think of this example. So it's the end of the year, you're packing up your room in residence or in your student house, and 
as you're packing stuff away, there's a $50 bill. You don't want to put it in your wallet because you're going to spend it right away. So you just pack it away, but you forget about it. And 10 years from now, you're busy unpacking your boxes in your new condo or your house or wherever you're living, and you discover this $50 bill. Okay. Now, $50 today, if you go to the Hamilton Farmer's Market and you go buy fruits and vegetables, or whatever you're going to be buying with $50, probably not fruits and vegetables, but you're buying whatever you're buying with $50 in today's money. Okay? And visualize whatever that is that you're buying. So take a second and visualize what you're buying with $50. Okay, now 10 years from now, if you went and spent that same $50 bill, what would you be buying with it? A whole lot less fruits and vegetables or beverages or food or so forth, okay? So $50 today is not worth the same on paper as $50 a year, two, or multiple years from now. We're very familiar with that topic, okay? And we have a name for it. Inflation, okay? So time value of money can be seen from an inflationary perspective. $50 today is not the same as it is a year from now. So, one way you can see it then, let's take that example further. So think 10 years from now. You've got that visual picture of that whole lot of less stuff that you've bought with that same $50 bill. How much would it have cost you today to buy that amount of less stuff? Okay, so let's say you go buy, 10 years from now, you go buy stuff with that $50 bill, and you get this variety of goods on your kitchen countertop. So there's all those vegetables that you've bought with $50 10 years from now, whatever that amount of stuff is. How much would it have cost you today, right now, to go to the farmer's market to buy that same? Okay, and there's the time value of money. Future monies, that $50 bill 10 years from now, is worth less in your hand today. Okay, so if someone says, I'm going to give you $1,000 five years from now, they could have given you a whole lot of less money in today's terms rather than $1,000 a year from now. Okay, this is a subtle one. It's easy for us to understand interest and and money building up and growing. But the reverse also holds. Money in the future is worth less in today's terms because of inflation. Okay, How much less? Well, we take that same formula and we just flip it around. So take that formula we were using a while ago where we said F is P 1 plus I to the N, okay? In present days, whatever cash flow you take in the future, so your $50 in the future, you divide it by 1 plus I to the N. That denominator is greater than 1. So you're dividing by a number larger than 1. So in present terms, that future value is worth less, okay? So you can either see it from an algebraic perspective or you can use that hypothetical example I gave you a while ago to understand that concept. And we're going to be using this equation form because what we're going to be doing in this entire section on engineering economics is we're going to project what future cash, cash amounts are. We're going to bring them to today's terms. We're always going to bring future money and bring it back to today's terms. We call it discounting. Discounting means we're reducing its value. So that's the denominator there. We're going to discount future cash amounts, F, by dividing through by that denominator that's larger than 1, discount it, and bring it to present day terms, the present value. And that's the PV is the, is the PV that we use in the NPV. When you've heard of NPV, net present value, that's what we're referring to, is that present value there. Okay. So 
let's, let's take a look at a bit of that. So slide 24 gives you an example of that. $1,000 in today's money is worth $1,000 in that first period. There's no discounting in the first period. But if I take $1,000, it's going to be worth, as you've all said, less next year. How much less is it going to be worth next year? If we're in an environment where money deflates at a value of 10%. So then it's 1,000 divided by 1.1, 1 .1, and we get 909. Okay, so and in a, an environment where money is deflating by 10% of inflation rate, that $1,000 in today's terms is worth $909 a year from now. Okay? This is why I want to talk about what we call cash flow equivalence. One way you can write that is quite simply by saying the following. You can also flip it around. So you can look at it in two perspectives. $909 now is equal to $1,000 next year if you invest it. Okay, so if you invest $909 now, it's equal to $1,000 next year. But you can also see it as $1,000 now is worth $909 a year later. Okay, so that future value, if I take that $1,000 bill in the future and I divide it by 1.1, it's the worth $909 in today's terms. If you go buy a fixed quantity of, of goods, today it's going to cost you $909 is the check that you're going to write or the bill that you're going to pay is $909 today. A year from now, that same amount of goods that you purchase is going to cost you $1,000 to write a check for. Okay. Yeah, we're going to come back to that and balance it up for a second. Okay. So $1,000 now is worth $909. A year from now is worth $826,751, and it just declines, and your money disappears away. Okay, so if you, if you, do that, if you put $1,000 and set it aside under your pillow or in your closet or wherever you're putting that money, it's not worth very much next year, and then the year after that it's declined even more in value, and a decade from now it's worth $424. So 10 years from now it's worth with a whole lot less, okay? So it's, it's, I'm, I'm emphasizing this point of view. People take a while to get used to this. Engineering and management students are very comfortable with this already, but not the rest of the class. Yes, Mark? What's like, um, the um, inflation rate? It, again, it depends from country to country. So in South Africa, when I was growing up, inflation was easily 5 6 7%. If you lived in Zimbabwe four or five years ago, there was a period of hyperinflation where it was Money was being changed by the debt by the hour because it was deflating in value. For, you, you got paid in the morning, it wasn't worth that same value by lunchtime when you went to go buy. If your inflation rate is greater than your interest rate, then you're not really Yeah, so we'll come to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so periods of inflation, like that Zimbabwe example is obviously extreme. It doesn't happen very often, but if you Google that example and, and research it a bit, you can see there were some numbers that were pretty crazy floating around during that period of devaluation of their currency. Most currencies, uh, certainly the currencies that you are likely to deal with in your life are fairly stable and don't deflate so much. Okay, so we've looked at deflation and interest. Now let's try to look at them together. So here's a slide that Dr. Marlin has put together and says, if you put $5,000 in a bank account, this is slide 27 now, we've jumped forward again. So $5,000 in a bank account, and you're earning interest at a rate of I star, whatever that value I star is. Okay, so let's consider that you've put $5,000 away, that's P, your present value, and you're getting an interest rate of I star. 
And that formula there tells you what the value is going to be n periods into the future. That $5,000 grows at a constant interest of I star. But if there's also inflation or time value of money called I dash, then it's not quite so clear what's happening anymore. In fact, if we go over one slide, as this shows you here, that if you take inflation into account, that future value Fn, even though it's a bigger number in the future, but there's deflation happening. Deflation says take that future value and divide by 1 plus I dash, as he's called it, is the inflation amount raised to the power n, and bring it back to present day terms. So that nice big value in the future, discount it and bring it back to present day p. Not so sweet a deal anymore because what you see now, if you sub the one equation into the other, you get essentially this amount. So your investment, he's called it C0 or P. If inflation matches the interest rate, so if I star equals I dash, you've really not done anything with your money. It's neither grown, but it's not been deflated away from you either. Okay? So that's one way to understand what time value of money is doing. Time value of money is it accounting for, for that change of interest rates, and it's accounting for the deflation. And you can see it in that, in that light. So back to this guy sitting happily here on the beach. That's fine, and you can do all these calculations on paper, and hypothetically, you can end up with 1.6 million but you're not going to be able to purchase the equivalent of $1.6 million worth of goods. Okay? That cash flow, that actual value of $1.6 million, you can't go physically buy what you can buy with $1.6 million in today's terms 45 years from now. Okay? So when you're saving for retirement, it's not as straightforward as simply using compound interest if you're not taking inflation into account. So while your money is growing, it's also devaluing, especially when you're dealing with time frames as long as you're dealing with here. 45 years, you have to take inflation and time value of money into account. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that in tutorial on Thursday. You'll come up with some calculations to help figure that out. Okay, so perhaps um, let me visualize, help you visualize this in, in the following way. We've looked at time value of money from two, two perspectives. And I sometimes find this is useful for those of you that have not become, that are not comfortable yet with this idea. You can see that money has this equivalence that if you take a present day amount and you take it to the future, so Fn periods into the future, and we've seen that the formula that does that is 1 plus i raised to the power n. We call that investing. When you take your present money and you take it into the future and we're using an interest rate of I. And maybe let's make it a bit more concrete and call it I inv. So that's your investment rate. Okay, now if you're lucky enough to do that, uh, that's great. But the opposite also holds. We call, if you take a future value and you bring it into today's money, that's borrowing. Or the bank is lending it to you or loaning that money to you. They're taking their, they could have used that money elsewhere, right? They didn't have to give it to you. They could have grown it in some other way. So they're taking their future potential use of that, that money. They're giving it to you in today's terms. And that's, that's borrowing and we have an interest rate I we can call it I loan, for example. Okay, so that sometimes helps to see what, what's going on is present values to future values can be seen as investing, but bringing future values into today's money is, is borrowing is, or, and is related very much to borrowing. We'll talk about that in a, in a few classes from now because when we build our chemical plants, we're going to have to go borrow money for it and that's exactly what we're doing. We're asking, should I take that money and invested in my chemical plant 
or should I invest that money in a different flow sheet of the chemical plant, or should I go invest it in another division of my company? Your boss is always making decisions on where to invest their money. Okay, so it's, this idea of time value of money is very much wrapped up with the concept of borrowing. And then I think uh, maybe this, this next example might help to just solidify the concepts here. So let's, uh, let's go over to slide 29 and we're going to consider this problem for the rest of the class today. <clears throat> so someone comes up to you and says, look, I'm going to give you $1,000 for every year that you're in university. So hopefully you're in university, just four years, that's the time frame we're going to look at here. At the start of each year, they give you $1,000. What is the present value of those $1,000 amounts? So four payments of $1,000. What is the present value of the first payment? $1,000. What's the present value of the second payment? Okay. So calculate that for the, we're at 10% time value of money. Calculate that for the four payments. And then calculate the cumulative sum of those four amounts. So again, use a table, use a systematic approach to do this. Anyone got a number? Okay. Nope. <laughs> Three, four, eight, six. What did you say, Mark? <coughs> Andrew? Three, four, eight, two. Three, four, eight, six. Okay. So let's take a look at that period. Zero, you've got income of $1,000. That's your money that you're receiving. And that's FN, the flow of money, that cash flow in the future period. It happens to be in the zeroth period that the money you receive. In terms of present value, so that's P, the present value. In the first period, that's also $1,000. Okay. So the next period, you receive another 1000 And its present value is... 909, okay? So if we follow the same idea as we did earlier, where we keep some notes here, we can put here that 909 is 1,000 divided by 1.01 1 .01 divided by 0 0.1. 
Okay, and then the second period, we receive another cash flow of a thousand, and its value in present day terms is eight hundred and twenty-six. And then that final period, you get a thousand dollars, and its value is seven hundred and fifty-one in terms of present day terms. Okay, now the cumulative sum of that, we call the net present value, NPV. So it's the net present value. Is a thousand in the first period. Then in the second period, that's one nine oh nine. Then it's two seven three six. And then it's three four eight seven. So that's simply the cumulative sum as we're going through the, through the four periods. Okay, so this, yeah, so it's, it's in here, the $1,000, okay? So the first period doesn't discount. What we're doing is we're taking this cash flow of $1,000 and asking what's it worth in today's terms. It's worth $1,000 in today's terms. The $1,000 next year is worth $900 in today's terms. So I'm calculating in today's terms, if I just look at these first two periods, that 1,000 plus 1,000 is worth 1,909 in today's value. If I look at all four periods, the four payments of $1,000 are worth $3,487 in today's terms. Let's take a look at the interpretation of that. One way you can see that 3487 is if someone gave you 3487 today, you could take $1,000 out of that 3487 every year, reinvest the balance at 10%, and on your final year, when you draw out that last $1,000, your balance will be zero. Okay, so you can always see it in reverse. Let me say that again. Someone could have given you $3,487 in today's, at this particular point in time. You immediately take $1,000 away, because that's, you're going to use that. You go invest the balance of it at 10%. Then next year, you go withdraw another $1,000 invest the balance, withdraw a thousand, invest the balance, keep going, and in that final period, you'll have exactly a thousand dollars left to withdraw and leaving you a balance of zero dollars left. Okay, so put it this way then, if someone comes to you and says, I can either give you four payments of a thousand dollars spread out over the four years, or I can give you four thousand dollars as a lump sum today, which option should you go for? You go for the lump sum of $4,000 today, okay? Because in present day values, you've got $4,000 in your pocket. Someone giving you $1,000 four times over four years is worth less in today's money. It's worth almost five, $500 less, okay? So play through that concept, do it on a spreadsheet and make sure you understand what's going on there.